UK, technologically challenged as ever. Um, welcome back for this afternoon session. Um, as, as always, I did a, a little bit of quick research over lunch um, and was lucky enough to have three young uh, Moroccan social entrepreneurs having, having lunch with us. So I asked them a couple of questions and we very quickly came down to the barriers that they felt as young social entrepreneurs uh, here in Morocco centered around the credibility uh, gap that young people face in presenting their ideas and their solutions to uh, people in positions of authority, whether in local or, or national governments. So we had a bit of a conversation about what might be useful uh, strategies for them to engage uh, to, to address that credibility question. And sort of adding to the, the, the questions that Mark posed, I'd be interested in the panelists' view of how one overcomes that, that credibility gap for young people. Um, in, in this morning's session, um, the, the recommendations in the uh, Think Global Trade Social um, report highlight the three areas that the government can influence policy, uh, to which we added the fourth dimension of, of education and training. So thinking about the, the legal and regulatory environments, thinking about the taxation uh, opportunities um, that that government policy can use, uh, tax incentives, um, and, and lastly, um, the area of government spending, how government uses its resources in order to promote this agenda. So I'm hoping that our, our colleagues on the panel will give you their, share their insights, um, but I'm also very keen to continue the conversation with all of you um, in, in the audience and therefore ask you to, to help us get beyond a very high level of, of sort of policy formulation. It's very easy to say we need to create tax incentives, for example, but what does that look like in practice? And how might we take this, this conversation forward to that next level of detail um, in, in the various areas of policy uh, formulation that we, we might discuss this afternoon? Um, I think I was going to stem from Tunisia uh, to, to present first. Yeah, there is a new uh, strategic plan for the social economy and so he's going to briefly introduce that um, highlighting uh, relevant points for you um, and then kind of break it up and, and in, in invite your engagement and response to that and then invite other panelists to contribute from there so if I can hand over to Wissem thanks very much indeed Merci. Tout d'abord, je veux, au mon nom et mes collègues tunisiens, remercier le, le British Council et la Banque mondiale de l'invitation à ce forum, fort intéressant. Euh, euh, comme vous le savez, euh, la Tunisie connaît aujourd'hui des problèmes sociaux urgents. Aujourd'hui, on a 15,5% euh, euh, des personnes qui vivent euh, sous le seuil de la pauvreté. C'est presque 1,5 million de personnes. On a un taux de chômage qui est élevé, un taux qui avoisine le euh, 15,2% en 2015, un taux de chômage qui est euh, élevé chez les jeunes, un taux de chômage euh, élevé pour les femmes. Les femmes, elles trouvent deux fois de difficulté à entrer sur le marché de travail en Tunisie. Un taux de chômage qui est élevé surtout dans les régions d'intérieur où le tissu tissu économique, il est trop faible. Donc, on a près de 600 000 euh, chômeurs en Tunisie aujourd'hui, dont l'un tiers sont des diplômés de l'enseignement supérieur. Donc, en matière d'emploi, le, mo le moins qu'on puisse dire, c'est que les solutions proposées semblent être insuffisantes pour répondre aux besoins de tous les chômeurs. Ceci peut être expliqué par la situation économique euh, 
qui est euh, la situation économique qui est difficile en Tunisie, d'où la nécessité de trouver des stratégies alternatives euh, pour pouvoir faire face à ces problèmes socio-économiques. L'économie sociale et solidaire d'une manière générale et l'entrepreneuriat social spécialement peut être une solution, une alternative et une solution intelligente dans le sens où elle permet la création d'emplois mais aussi l'amélioration des conditions de vie et elle permet l'intégration des jeunes chômeurs dans la vie économique. L'entrepreneuriat social, elle contribue aussi au développement local euh, elle contribue à la solidarité et à la cohésion sociale. Donc, euh, euh, elle, a un, elle peut jouer en ce moment un rôle très important, surtout aussi qu'elle peut opérer là où les politiques publiques en matière d'emploi ont échoué. C'est pourquoi, en Tunisie, il y avait l'unanimité sur la, la mise en place des fondements et des assises de l'économie sociale et solidaire et de renforcer sont sa contribution dans le développement économique à l'échelle nationale, mais surtout à l'échelle régionale et euh, locale. Euh, donc, euh, la volonté politique, elle existe, il y est. Euh, cette volonté politique, elle s'est traduite dans le plan de développement stratégique pour la période 2016-2020. Dans ce plan de développement, il y a tout un volet, euh, il y a tout un volet sur le développement de l'économie sociale et solidaire, d'une façon générale. Euh, on a élaboré ce plan de développement avec une approche participative. On a mis en place une commission sectorielle où tout le monde a participé. C'était ouvert. La société civile, les associations qui travaillent sur l'économie sociale et solidaire, sur l'entrepreneuriat social, les partenaires sociaux, et les différents, le gouvernement, donc les différents ministères qui, qui sont appliqués directement ou indirectement dans l'économie sociale et solidaire. On a fait un diagnostic, on s'est mis d'accord sur les problématiques ensemble. On a vu que euh, euh, le, le premier, la, euh, la, la première problématique, c'est que la, la reconnaissance institutionnelle en Tunisie de l'économie sociale et solidaire elle, elle, est, elle reste faible. La, la relation entre les pouvoirs publics et les organisations de l'économie sociale et solidaire, euh, elle, est, euh, elle se fait selon une dimension sectorielle avec une coordination assez faible. Donc, euh, spécialement pour les, 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 les entreprises sociales, on a trouvé que le, la, il y a euh, l'absence d'un cadre juridique général. Il entrave le développement et la création d'entreprises sociales. Donc, c'est pourquoi on va travailler prochainement, sur, euh, on va commencer à travailler sur l'élaboration d'une loi, d'une loi 4, donc d'un cadre euh, juridique clair qui favorise l'émergence euh, de, de la création de, euh, des entreprises sociales et le développement des entreprises sociales qui existent. Le deuxième euh, euh, problème, euh, c'est le problème institutionnel. Je reviens au problème institutionnel. Donc, on va travailler sur la création d'une structure publique qui sera chargée de l'économie sociale et solidaire. Elle sera, elle sera chargée de piloter, de coordonner euh, avec les différents intervenants. Euh, mais aussi, on va travailler sur la création d'un conseil supérieur de l'économie sociale et solidaire. Ce sera un espace de dialogue qui va regrouper tous les, euh, les intervenants dans le secteur, que ce soit la société civile, les partenaires sociaux et l'administration euh, et le gouvernement. Donc. Le troisième point, c'est le, euh, le problème d'accès au financement. On a, on a identifié un, un, un problème d'accès au financement pour l'entrepreneur en général et surtout spécialement pour l'entrepreneur euh, social. Donc, euh, sur la demande des, des structures publiques de qui euh, euh, donnent des financements pour la création des PME. Et ils exigent que euh, la nécessité de créer, euh, de promulguer la loi, la loi 4 pour qu'ils puissent créer des mécanismes spécifiques de financement de la création de, cette, euh, de ce type d'entreprise. De, Donc on va travailler, après la promulgation de la loi, on va euh, ça sera la création de 
des mécanismes spécifiques de financement pour la création des, des entreprises sociales. Aussi, euh, on va mettre en place un, un programme national pour l'ancrage euh, de, euh, de la culture, euh, la culture en, entrepreneuriale donc, euh, dans le dispositif éducatif. Donc on va travailler sur la mise en place des programmes de formation dans le dispositif scolaire et universitaire afin de, 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 faire, de préparer des jeunes à la vie active après avec un esprit entrepreneurial développé. Euh, le, le, le cinquième point, c'est le point qui concerne la communication et l'information. On a vu aussi qu'il y a une défaillance du point de vue communication et information sur l'économie sociale et solidaire d'une façon générale. Donc on va travailler sur l'élaboration d'une stratégie nationale de communication et d'information sur l'économie sociale et solidaire à travers des programmes de communication de, pour améliorer l'image et faire connaître le, ce type d'entreprise de, euh, aux gens. Ça, c'est globalement les, les cinq axes sur lesquels on va travailler durant la période 2016-2020. I think we should just share one microphone. Um, in, in that spirit of um, social enterprise where you have to just make do with what resources you have available. Um, but here we are, we've got lots of um, microphones and lots of panelists. Um, so just, just summarizing um, that response, um, legal frameworks, financial frameworks, a government structure and institutional framework for responsiveness and communication, strategic communication uh, to, to promulgate the, the new policy, raise awareness and um, putting uh, social enterprise into schools and into the education system. Sounds very much like other aspects of what we've heard already this morning So I'm going to invite um, other panelists to comment um, or to perhaps add a, um, you know, some specific specifics of their own experience uh, represented by Lebanon, Morocco and, and Paula with a, a UK and global view. Um, and then quickly uh, turn, turn the opportunity over to, to the rest of the uh, audience for you to raise questions. But perhaps... Um, Mustafa, we could ask for the Moroccan, uh, any, any comments or feedback from the Moroccan experience? Tout d'abord, je veux remercier les organisateurs de nous avoir invités à participer avec vous à cet événement. Et concernant l'entrepreneuriat social et l'économie sociale et solidaire en général, euh, tout d'abord, que la première question que je, que je veux soulever, c'est tout d'abord euh, celle du concept et de la définition. Euh, aussi, celle de la perception de l'économie sociale et solidaire et du rôle qui lui est assigné euh, dans notre société. Euh, concernant les définitions, euh, les définitions sont diverses et chaque définition euh, fait partie d'une réalité d'un de, de, groupe de sociétés ou des sociétés, donc on n'a pas une définition Universel. Et concernant les conceptions que nous avons dans nos sociétés et les rôles assignés à l'économie sociale et solidaire, je peux vous dire euh, avec euh, une expression euh, claire que celle que nous avons est une conception euh, misérable de l'économie sociale et solidaire. 
Cela veut dire que les rôles assignés à l'économie sociale et solidaire dans nos sociétés sont surtout ceux de faire face à la précarité et à la pauvreté. C'est -ce que, ce que j'appelle la chambre de réanimation. C'est réanimer les gens qui sont en coma. Et ce n'est qu'une qu mission parmi, parmi les autres missions de l'économie sociale et solidaire et de l'entrepreneuriat social, parce que à côté de, de cette chambre de réanimation, il doit y avoir aussi une chambre de rééducation. Et après, une autre, un autre compartiment de musculation. Cela veut dire que les entreprises de l'économie sociale et solidaire ne sont pas faites seulement pour faire face à la précarité et à la pauvreté, mais pour mettre en place une économie parallèle à l'économie capitaliste et pour essayer d'avoir une sorte d'économie inclusive qui peut favoriser à tous les citoyens de participer à la dynamique économique, pas seulement pour améliorer le produit intérieur brut et le PIB, mais pour aussi participer au, à ce que d'autres pays appellent le bonheur intérieur brut. Et ça a une relation avec euh, aussi la, la distribution des richesses et ce que nous n'avons pas encore instaurer comme culture dans, notre, dans nos sociétés. Autre chose, quand nous parlons de, de l'économie sociale et solidaire et de l'entrepreneuriat social, aucun de nos pays n'a vraiment une, une vraie stratégie nationale de l'économie sociale et solidaire. Personne ne se pose la question à propos des entreprises de l'économie sociale et solidaire cette économie va contribuer au PIB national d'ici une dizaine ou une quinzaine d'années à combien de points L'économie sociale, les entreprises d'économie sociale et solidaire maintenant au Maroc ne contribuent qu'à à peu près 2,5 à 3% du PIB national. Euh, en comparant notre pays à d'autres pays comme les pays occidentaux tels que la France et autres, ou les, les entreprises de l'économie sociale et solidaire contribuent à plus de 10%. Donc cette absence d'une stratégie nationale, elle traduit une absence d'une vision de l'avenir de l'économie sociale et, et solidaire, et sème la confusion en ce qui concerne la contribution de l'économie sociale et solidaire, parce qu'il y a ceux qui la, qui la qualifient d'une économie complémentaire, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire ça, ça veut dire que c'est les sociétés qui sont le modèle euh, exemplaire de l'économie et que les coopératives et les, et les, et les entreprises de l'économie sociale et solidaire et celles de l'entrepreneuriat social, elles sont seulement complémentaires et ils ne seront pas un vrai pilier de l'économie euh, nationale. Il y a autre qui le qualifie d'économie... Euh, alternative, alternative c'est ça. L'économie alternative. C'est vrai, il est alternative pour les individus. Mais il ne peut pas être une économie alternative. Ça, ça veut dire qu'il va remplacer carrément... Euh, l'économie euh, des entreprises euh, capitalistes, des sociétés. Donc, euh, je crois que la résolution de la, la problématique de l'économie sociale et solidaire et des entreprises, de, 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 des entreprises sociales euh, demande une clarification chez les politiques, et chez la classe politique, et chez les décideurs de, de tout cela pour arriver à prendre vraiment les, les, les décisions euh, nécessaire pour faire avancer euh, ce domaine de, de l'entreprise 
de l'économie sociale et solidaire et de l'entrepreneuriat social. Merci. Thank you. Um, so we spent some time this morning, I think, thinking about the definitions, and, and I'm, I'm hoping we're not going to revisit all of that. Um, but perhaps if I can turn to um, Paula and, and, and reflect perhaps some of the UK's experience of working, as, as Dan highlighted, with fairly broad definitions fairly inclusive definitions so that we uh, kind of can move forward in, in terms of the conversation. Um, I, I think sometimes we get stuck in some of these conversations on, on, on points of definition. Um, but um, if, if I can hand over to Paula now and, and uh, reflect on the UK's uh, policy framework and experience. Hello. Um, just briefly, I wanted to explain from the British Council's point of view. Um, the, the British Council has recognised social enterprise as a global priority um, that we, we want to support and, and, and really work on globally. Um, we have a programme currently in 26 countries, um, and those range from Canada through to Ghana, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, um, across to Asia, so uh, even China, Myanmar, Hong Kong, India, um, and then into MENA, where really Morocco um, is, is our crown uh, in, the, in the jewel of our work in, in the Middle East and North Africa region at the moment. Um, and the reason the British Council is active in this space um, it's really because we see a huge amount of opportunity for collaboration um, as I think globally there are many people who want to engage in this discussion of how we can perhaps run our economies in a more impactful way um, and also that it brings together many different people. So we engage with um, academics, um, we engage with policy makers, we engage very much with young people um, often who are leading or aspiring, aspiring to lead social enterprises. Um, and the UK has got some um, experience, as, as David's mentioned, um, but also we don't believe we have all the answers. And um, uh, Peter Holbrook from Social Enterprise UK, he, he's s spoken to other countries saying you have the second mover advantage in some ways. So um, you're able to perhaps take stock of some of the early efforts that have been made in other countries and from that quite large menu of, of things that people have tried to select which perhaps fits best in your countries. Um, and across the globe, social enterprise, social and solidarity economy or social entrepreneurs, <laughs> I mean, whatever phrase you want to use, it is... It has a different cultural um, connection. It has a different history, uh, uh, often quite a proud heritage, um, which needs to be recognised in moving forward. Um, so, for policymakers, you know, we would also always recommend that they first invest in knowing where they are at the moment, um, how to celebrate local success stories. Um, doing some research to understand some of the issues that are being faced by social entrepreneurs. Um, and the area of legal structures quite often um, comes up, um, which I think is, is perfectly sensible. So our legal structures generally have been created on, you're either a private profit business, um, you can do uh, almost what you want to generate private profits and then the government tax you, um, or you're a charity or an NGO, um, you may get tax, taxation privileges, but you're much more restrained in your business model uh, and, and in how uh, you're going to achieve your goals. And then you have government. So that's very simplified. That's, that's sort of the structure that most countries are currently operating in. And that was the situation in the UK um, back in, I guess, 2000, when the government really um, set out its stand to say, you know, we, we want to have a strategy to, to support social enterprise. Um, and so many countries are looking at different legal um, options. 
and also asking how can we support social enterprise um, in, in, a, in a fair way and, and a transparent way, um, not wanting to give preferential treatment. But for example, in Vietnam, Vietnam has passed a social enterprise law um, recently, and that will mean that social enterprises in Vietnam have um, certain advantages, including um, uh, freedoms in terms of their trading, um, uh, some sort of preferential treatments in when they're trying to get certain licenses, um, and there's a commitment in there about the government of Vietnam continuing to look at how they support uh, social enterprises. Um, so we're seeing some quite bold moves um, happening um, globally. Um, and certainly I think, I think that's the other part of the story. So knowing where you are, uh, celebrating local success, investing and understanding what is locally, um, but then also keeping an eye on where you might want to go. And it might be that you want to address, um, uh, to create a more innovative model of delivering public services. Maybe that's one of the drivers for you and you want to look at how social enterprises globally are delivering public services. Um, or it might be that you really want to tackle um, employment, uh, both in terms of social enterprises employing people, um, but also in terms of young people often um, being quite passionate to set up social enterprises and to become employers themselves. Um, and so these different drivers are all present uh, in, in, in other countries and can be looked at in terms of, well, what does that mean to you? If that's where you want to go, what are the specific um, sort of policy mechanisms that might be, might be most uh, practical uh, to get there? But I think globally what we're seeing is a, a huge move um, from a huge range of countries, uh, both in terms of tax incentives, um, in terms of spending and in terms of regulations. Um, uh, to give uh, an another example, which uh, you may not immediately think of, so in, in India, 2% um, uh, of profits from uh, private businesses now has to be reinvested in corporate social responsibility. So that's coming from a different angle. It's actually saying to the mainstream private businesses, you know, that we need to see actually a more significant amount of your profits being fed back into impact um, and legislating for that, um, which is obviously, an, again, quite a bold move um, by the government in India. Um, still, we, 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 they're still working on implementing um, that on the ground, uh, which uh, we're, we're engaged in. Um, so I hope that helps, David. Thanks very much. And... Um, that, that truly, uh, truly global um, reflection with, with examples from India and Vietnam and, and indeed the UK uh, is, is, is part of the, if you like, the, the philosophy that the British Council has brought to this. Um, not that we have um, from the UK necessarily got all the answers, but, but we're co-creating, as somebody suggested earlier, better ways of tackling some of the problems we face thinking of uh, different ways of tackling uh, the problems that uh, are faced. Perhaps I could invite uh, Natalia to describe uh, the conditions in Lebanon. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Natalia. I'm a founding partner and consultant with Beyond Reform and Development. It's a public management consulting firm working on policy innovation, capacity development, and uh, institutional reform. And we had the chance, uh, given our passion and drive, we've had the chance to work on different levels of the social entrepreneurship development process. Uh, first on uh, education, uh, also on growth and networking, so supporting the ecosystem, but also on legislation and uh, regulation and control of the, of the process. Um, the, I think the discussion is quite interesting in terms of uh, how present the government should be, or how present has it been so far. Uh, I think one of the things that we can say, and I think these are common things or trends in the region, plus or minus some factual or contextual uh, elements that, that might change from one country to another, I think one of the things that is a, that is a given is that government cannot do it alone. And uh, promoting or developing a, a a framework, a legal framework for social business, for social entrepreneurship is not enough. 
uh, it needs to, and I think the panel, the, the panel before lunch, some, uh, some speakers highlighted this well, well. I think um, if this issue does not come from a very local, local uh, aspect, so how can social entrepreneurship serve local development and local actors? It will always be restrained to a certain group of people with more privileges than others who don't, who doesn't necessarily face the same challenges as the people who live in the different local lo localities, sorry, or uh, or uh, areas. Uh, and I think this has so far this has created a very big gap between government and and citizens in general. Um, so if I may go back to your question earlier, David, about like what can, what can uh, uh, decrease this gap in trust or build trust between government and citizens, I think one of the first things that needs to be done is start thinking of locally, locally driven socioeconomic development. And I think from that point on, uh, uh, we, can, we can think of a definition that is suitable for the context. We can think of what are... Um, where are areas that the different actors should be should intervene, while at the same time keeping in mind that entrepreneurship, at least by definition, is very individually driven and it's individual and private initiative. So how to maintain a very important role for government, but not take out from this process uh, entirely the the private initiative side of things, which 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 is what is leading to the development of this, of this sector in our region. Uh, I think um, definitely working on, as I said, locally driven uh, development strategies, but also education. Uh, and I'm not an expert, I can't, can't pretend that I'm an expert in the Tunisian case, but I do think that there were some elements of the strategy that have existed for a while. So I, like, what are things that would make them now more efficient than what they used to be before? Uh, same goes for Lebanon, same goes for many of our countries. I think uh, what has been lacking so far is actual citizen engagement in the process. Um, but also, uh, I think government can play a big role in supporting the infrastructure and creating, of course, the necessary legislative and, and uh, re regulatory framework. But also, government can definitely support in, uh, in giving the sector more credibility. So by creating networks and awareness and, and, uh, and uh, information about this sector, government can definitely play a more enabling role in developing and growing the sector. Uh, however, I think one of the main challenges for government is that government doesn't know. So from our work with government so far, I think one of the most, uh, one of the things that we were able to, to uh, that was most evident is that government officials, decision makers, and people in, in policy processes don't know what social entrepreneurship means. So, so I think it, it is kind of a cycle, and why not start by engaging different actors? And, and I was just saying over lunch that in this room there are no policy makers, or very few. So why not engage them more because, of, because they lack the information and they lack the knowledge and, and therefore will not be able to do anything that is that is actually responsive to the needs that, that occur. So I think starting to engage government in this conversation and uh, transferring the knowledge that we have so far, that we have accumulated so far as practitioners, as experts, as academia, I think that's a first step for, uh, for the sector to grow. And I think another, another aspect of it is learning from each other and not necessarily sticking to existing frameworks that are that are being built around the world, that are, some are being questioned, some are being, uh, some are being rethought of. So trying to come up with our own or something that's very, very contextual to our region, to our countries, and that would actually serve the development of, or the growth of these entities. Um, finally, uh, I don't know if I said something about the networks, I think, yeah, I did. So governments helping in creating networks around, around social entrepreneurship will definitely bridge the gap between social entrepreneurs, local communities, and, and, um, and governments. And one last thing, again, the local issue, uh, and from our experience in, in, in Lebanon and uh, Iraq and Yemen, I think social entrepreneurship is a solution, or, or social entrepreneurs 
are presenting solutions so that our governments eventually can, can take these solutions and, and help scale them up and generalize them into policy and not the, the other way around. So I think one of, the, one of the things that has been alarming to governments and policymakers so far is that uh, for them social entrepreneurship or social enterprises are there to replace what the government is doing or what the private sector is doing, when in fact it's the other way around. And I think the last few years have been very, very... Uh, we've seen clearly that the current structure of systems is not efficient. And that's why we have increasing uh, levels of unemployment, increasing levels of poverty, increasing levels of tensions due to socioeconomic... Okay, I think they're asking me to stop. To socioeconomic uh, uh, triggers or competition. So... Uh, Hello. Oh. Um, l lastly, on our panel, um, uh, Dr. Hatta Abi Habib, um, slightly putting him on the spot, but I think uh, an experience in finance and the financing issues related to um, enterprise development, and I, I think we've all identified the constraints that social enterprise face. Just any, any lessons from the Lebanese experience that reflects uh, the innovative use of financing as part of the package of policy solutions? Well, thank you. Uh, I might be a bit tangential to the subject. I only deal with finance. and I'm not a specialist in social entrepreneurship or enterprise, but I'll try my best. Um, uh, I think there has been a consensus building up statements, although not stated like that, that one needs government, one needs uh, finance at large, one needs the social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs at large, because even ordinary entrepreneurs seeking profit, if they address an economic problem in a region, a zone, etc., will in part be social entrepreneurs, while then we have the specialized social entrepreneurs who need to sustain themselves financially and economically, but the primary objective is defined socially. And finally, we also need uh, the uh, educational structure in a country to be integrated. So we need integration of effort, and diversity, and to include government. In a place like Lebanon, which is a very private enterprise, plus a government always under pressure. And let's face it, in most of the emerging world, the social changes have really advanced way beyond the state building. And therefore, government sometimes can be a constraint, be it also a help. So how do you integrate all this and maintain diversity and integration in a positive way? Diversity amongst the four different needed types of players and amongst each sector, diverse players as well to ensure continuous surveillance, mapping, and therefore application to solve problems. And to optimize. Well, I will speak on the financial side. In Lebanon, uh, we came out of a very long civil war. And amongst many other problems, we are a country where banking is very powerful. At the moment, our banks have a balance sheet, really deposits, about three and a half times the GDP. That's our power and strength, private sector plus our communities abroad. How to tap this to solve two fundamental problems after the war, where we had concentration of lending and finance in the central areas of the country, Beirut and surrounding regions, even though we are a very small country, and concentration of funding 
to all established businesses, traditional businesses, uh, to uh, larger firms and firms with very well set histories. So you wanted to motivate the regions, the under helped, not necessarily underdeveloped other segments of our geography, plus sectors of the population which were going to renew themselves or start anew, startups, and how to help innovation against this. We thought, and this is the institution which I still run, was one of the first solutions to create a program whereby you solve those issues with an instrument. And the instrument chosen was a high uh, guarantee to banks in order to lend. So we started with a guarantee of 75% of a loan. Uh, and with such a high level of guarantee, of course, depending on a business plan and the viability of projects, a distant region will become much closer in identification with the center. A small enterprise becomes much closer in its risk to an old enterprise. A startup will have a chance against old established businesses. We did that. And it is open to the entire banking sector. So we have 1,200 branches marketing this throughout the country, which is only 4,000 square miles, 10,000 square kilometers, a little larger than Casablanca. So uh, then we started developing special instruments, whereby we had a program for innovation, knowing that it's more risky than the rest. We gave a guarantee of 90%. Trees need longer periods, so we give them 10 years loans. Um, replaceable, renewable energy requires longer term. We give them 15-year uh, uh, loans. In all this, the banks are involved, the private sector is involved, the entrepreneurs and people who run, let us say, accelerators, incubators, etc are also involved, and the government was involved through the central bank without any bureaucracy. Loans given, which are guaranteed by this program and other programs later developed by the central bank uh, would automatically get exemptions from statutory reserves by the central bank, which is a public institution, plus certain subsidies from the treasury. So the government is involved in all this this covers SMEs, small and medium enterprises, in the productive sectors and in the regions, but it also covers social enterprise. It's not made for social enterprise, but cooperatives can uh, benefit, NGOs which are involved in production can benefit, uh, centers which offer services of an innovation uh, style can also benefit. Later on, again, the private sector and the public sector come in with programs for equity, for seed capital, etc., and venture capital. The central bank gave incentives to the banks to be able to use some of their equity to participate in seed and venture capital funds aimed at the knowledge economy. The government got money from the World Bank, which they entrusted to my company, Kafalat, to run as co-funding with a view of pushing the private investors, because we have very powerful teams of analysis, plus very deep data having worked for 16 years in the field, to come towards our view of development and co-investments. And now we notice also quite a profusion in response to this of incubators for technology and now for some social enterprise like enterprises. We have accelerators, uh, a recent accelerator by young people in the city of Tripoli, which is a troubled region, is getting attention from everywhere. And they got their money through crowdfunding. 
Now we have crowdfunding facilities in the country where small investors, but with good supervision from the monetary authorities, can participate. And one of the uh, uh, crowdfunding efforts is socially oriented. You pay money, you don't get back profit. You buy products in return for your participation, plus a lot of highly engineered products. I think the game is to involve everybody in a diverse set of ways so they don't have close decision-making channels, to combine the efforts into core activities and competing activities so you get the best coverage of the terrain and therefore uh, the best return socially as well as economically on the uh, uh, resources committed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so that was a really um, helpful and interesting reflection on financing mechanisms and um, different types of instruments for different purposes to stimulate growth, um, principally private sector, but, but also social enterprise growth. I'd like to invite um, feedback from the audience, and I suppose I'm going to pose the most simple, because I'm a simple kind of person, question to you all, um, which is, well, let, let, let's kind of make it a little bit more participative. Um, just to, to get some senses of what would be your top um, policy requests. Imagine you're sitting addressing uh, a panel of, of policy makers. Um, we're in Morocco, so we'll be Moroccan. And we're officials from across uh, the Moroccan government. And we are looking for your, your input. Um, we have the, uh, our colleague from the uh, Social Development Agency sat here, so he'll, he'll take lots of notes. But what would be people's top priority requests from us? And if we can make them as specific as possible, um, whilst hopefully still generalizable, because I'd like the panel then to be able to react to, to your proposals, your suggestions, your priorities, with reflections and experience either from the UK or from the different uh, countries that we have represented on our panel. Anyone care to, to jump in with their first policy request? Stunned silence? Okay, uh, for Egypt, we don't have a law for uh, social enterprises. So uh, I'm a company, but I'm a social enterprise, but because we have no differentiation, I'm either a company or an NGO. So this is something we need to, uh, to introduce to our law. We also have no uh, tax cuts for startups. Uh, we're like paying as much as millionaires pay, like we're, it's 20% taxes. And, um, and a third thing for me would be to, um, increase the incentives of rechanneling profit into uh, NGOs. Like in the Egyptian law, it's maximum of 7% cut. Uh, but of course, uh, I think like in my own uh, case, like the plan is to rechannel profit into the artisans community I'm working with, most of the profit, and I'll, I'll have to pay taxes as well. So this is really like not, uh, not something that I really like. That's it, thank you. Three, three very clear requests to the Egyptian government. We don't have them uh, with us on the panel, but I'm, I'm going back to Cairo. Um, I'll see who I can speak to. Come on, colleagues. There must, must be plenty of other requests that we've got. Apparently not, no. Well, uh, our colleagues on the government side of the panel can congratulate themselves 
for in fact having created the enabling environment that, that is conducive to your growth and development. Was that what we heard? Ah, oh, there's another one up there. I think, again, I'm going to cite Rania because I'm from Egypt as well. But I have a different idea here. Why doesn't the British Council in, um, intermediate between us, between the uh, social enterprises or the startups and the government? Uh, since you have good relations with them and you are trusted and credited, so why don't you intermediate and be the good guy <laughs> along the story? <laughs> I was going to say, well, the, the, I, there are a number of panelists who can respond to that. And, <laughs> okay. um, just, just to respond as, as in, in my capacity as the kind of regional uh, lead for our work in social enterprise, um, absolutely, the answer is yes. This is a priority globally, as, as Paula described. Um, so the kind of suggestions you're making, and again, the more specific they are, the more perhaps helpful we can be in, in, in brokering that conversation. But I'll pass over to, to Paula and then perhaps to Natalia to, to describe how that conversation can be developed and made to be productive. Yeah, so um, within our global social enterprise program, um, policy dialogue and government engagement is a really key uh, part of what we hope we can bring. Um, because of our longevity in so many countries and because we're seen as quite a trusted um, partner to, to governments. Um, we do that through dialogues often, um, so we, we're not preaching, but what we can do is um, to bring uh, UK uh, perspectives and uh, sometimes multilateral perspectives are also quite helpful um, to, to open the... Um, ideas of what is possible um, and what, what, what you can achieve. Um, so, so that's absolutely what we do. Um, for example, in Thailand, um, we had uh, stu a study visits of uh, policymakers coming to the UK, um, which then led directly to the setting up of the Thai Social Enterprise Office, um, which is funded um, through uh, government, um, government legislation. It's actually... Um, funded by the profits of, um, I think, the tobacco industry or some industry uh, uh, entity they have, um, which then funds the Thai Social Enterprise Office. Um, but that came about directly as a result of the uh, British Council study visits. Um, and they most recently have gone on to look very much at social investment um, in a similar way. And we're engaging with the... Um, the leader of the, uh, the, the Thai uh, stock exchange and, and the Thai um, central bank. Um, so we, we very much hope that that's something we can do. Um, on, on legal structures, I think it's just this um, issue the world over that comes up in all of our dialogues. Um, and I think it's not just for new social entrepreneurs who want to set up in business uh, in, in, in the most... Um, sort of a way that seems to fit them. Um, but it's also then how the rest of the ecosystem has grown around that. So in the UK, um, for sure, um, if you were registered as a company, you couldn't really attract grant funding, philanthropic funding, um, aid funding was sometimes difficult to access. Um, it really sort of limited you to a very sort of push towards a commercial um, model and in fact the business support that you probably would have then also um, been given <laughs> the, the sort of providers that you'd have gone to wouldn't have really understood the social objectives and how that needed to be built throughout your business strategy and, and your model so it's it's sort of how that affects the whole um, the way the way the ecosystem is designed um, which which is also um, coming to bear so in, in the community interest company in the UK was um, uh, came into, into place in 2005, and there's over 10,000 um, community interest companies uh, that are registered. Um, uh, so I think in that way, it's, it, it, it shows there's a big appetite. Um, and I think especially for young people um, who want to set up in business and want to look at different models, 
because um, we have a cooperative legal structure in the UK as well. Um, but sometimes the younger people particularly you know, want to look at different models, different ways of working. And I think the community interest company structure is just quite um, easy and open to register, but your social and environmental impact is locked in. So if you were to cease trading, your assets would have to go to either a charity or another community interest company with similar objectives. So it's not that you could sell out when your business is a, a, an incredible success and just sell out and take the, take the assets out. Um, that, that sort of impact is locked in. Um, but you know, it, it is also quite flexible for what the entrepreneur might want to do and, and how, they, how they want to run their business. So I, I think that's been quite helpful. Um. Uh, I don't know which hat to wear, my activist hat or my consultant hat. Uh, my activist hat would say, uh, no, we need to do this ourselves. Uh, so we need to address government directly. Uh, my, 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 other hat, my other part <laughs> would say, definitely, I think uh, British Council or any trusted organization can play a role in facilitating this conversation. At the same time, I think two elements are needed. One is political will uh, to actually engage in something. And, and Rissam mentioned that there is political will in Tunisia, for example, to, to push the process forward. So I think political will is a must. So with or without uh, the support of trusted organizations, if there isn't a political will to support the process, then it's going to be very tough to actually do something that is really responsive to the actual needs. The second thing I think is uh, our readiness to engage together as social entrepreneurs, ecosystem and communities uh, in trying to think or create a, a model of what could be the best, best models in plural, not just one. So what are options that we could present to government and then take it from there and then the, uh, the British Council or any other organization can facilitate that conversation. So I think there, is, there isn't really a consensus about the different definitions of social enterprises. What's the definition that, you, that would fit us the most as countries, as regions? But also, what are tax incentives that we're looking for? Is it related to tax cuts or is it related to salaries or is it related to... So what are, what are different elements or options that we should be looking at so that when we get together with government and if there is political will, then the, the, the conversation can mature into something that's more concrete and less, uh, less general. So that's... Ce que je peux ajouter aussi, c'est lorsqu'on parle des entreprises de l'économie sociale et solidaire ou de l'entrepreneur social, on ne parle pas toujours d'une entreprise ou des entreprises qui ont le même statut. Il y a des entreprises qui sont euh, ou qui opèrent dans le cadre d'une économie marchande, telle que les coopératives par exemple, et d'autres qui opèrent dans le cadre d'économies non marchandes, telles que les associations, les ONG, etc. Et chez nous, au Maroc, dans le domaine de l'économie sociale et solidaire, on a, les, on a les associations, on a les coopératives, on a les mutuelles, et on a aussi les entreprises euh, sociales euh, nouvellement arrivées. Euh, C'est des entreprises qui font des efforts euh, en matière d'investissement d'une partie de leurs euh, euh, bénéfices euh, en ce qui concerne la mise à niveau de leur, euh, de leur environnement. Euh, donc lorsque nous parlons euh, de ce volet-là de fiscalité, il faut, il faut essayer de le faire tout en prenant en considération ces, ces différences euh, entre ces types euh, d'entreprises euh, d'économie sociale et solidaire et de l'entrepreneuriat social. Autre chose, je crois qu'au qu qu Maroc, nous avons cette opportunité de ce grand chantier 
de régionalisation avancée parce que l'une des problématiques de nos pays, c'est les, le, les grands écarts entre régions et localités. Euh, en comparant Casablanca, la région Casablanca-Rabat à la région Warzazat et, et autres, nous allons euh, nous trouver devant euh, des écarts énormes en ce qui concerne les, les taux d'alphabétisation, de scolarisation des femmes, euh, aussi du chômage, etc., etc., etc. Ce qui fait euh, l'approche, euh, je crois, ne doit pas être limitée aux politiques au niveau national et, et à la coordination entre les différents ministères, parce que aussi l'une des problématiques, c'est que le, la plupart des administrations fonctionnent sous forme de silos étanches et que la création des synergies est l'un des handicaps aussi qui, qui font face euh, au développement de, de nos pays. Mais l'un des grands défis aussi, c'est celui d'essayer de, d'ancrer euh, le développement des, des entreprises de l'économie sociale et solidaire et celui de l'entrepreneuriat social au niveau local et au niveau régional et essayer aussi de faire des régions une vraie locomotive de développement parce qu'à ce moment-là, il y aura certainement euh, des concepts adaptés à, à chaque région parce que la réalité de toutes les régions n'est pas, pas la même, et même en matière de fiscalité. Et moi, je me suis toujours posé la question, c'est pourquoi on parle lorsqu'il s'agit euh, euh, parfois des décisions disciplinaires d'une zone A, zone B, zone C, et lorsqu'il lorsqu s'agit d'investissement et de développement territorial, on a toujours un standard national. Je crois qu'il est temps de, de franchir cette étape pour essayer de réfléchir euh, aussi euh, dans ce cadre de dimension régionale et euh, locale aussi. Merci. Thank you. And I think that's uh, a, a challenging question that uh, is common to, to many countries um, in the region. I think Tunisia has that shared challenge of discrepancies between the conditions uh, Lebanon in a, in a relatively small geographical space has, has similar challenges and of course Egypt um, very large scale differences between Cairo and, and, and other parts of, of the country. I'm conscious that I, I think the organizers are, are waving at me. I just wanted to go back to my three um, young entrepreneurs at lunchtime and we had a very quick conversation about this question of credibility and the question of standards and, and who sets the standards um, and how are those um, recognized and enforced. And so I just wanted to get, again, a little, sh little sense of participation. Um, is there a role for government in defining the standards Uh, through which social enterprises work and d would that help build their credibility and build the trust between citizens and, and social enterprise and between social enterprise and government? That was quite a long question. <laughs> so I'll, I'll break it down into something more just, just uh, simpler. Is there a role for government in setting standards for the social enterprise sector? Just a quick show of hands. There was, a, there was a yes over there. Quite. What about on the panel? Yes? We think there's a role on the panel. Where? But not alone. Okay. Okay. So, to, just to answer the questions that, that, that the young people were challenging me with, with who, whose role is it? And, and just to, 
to get the sense of, of, of an answer to that question. I think there is work we can do together uh, to bring international experience, UK experience, um, experience from within the region um, into that conversation. Thank you very much to the panelists and thank you to, to you as an audience.